Kia ora koutou and welcome to the games I got rid of in 2020. Now some of you would have seen a video I did where I downsized my collection. This list does not include the games that were put on the sell list for that one. I've still actually got to sell all those games. These are the 20 or so games that I got rid of during the year. Now I'm only going to spotlight about 15 of them. There's a few that I also got rid of that I'm just not going to bother talking about because I may have played them once and yeah, I don't really have much to say about them. Now, 3-Minute Board Games is entirely funded by Patreon and our sponsorship deal with Board Game Atlas. Board Game Atlas doesn't care what we review and they don't give us games. And this means we're free to do videos like this where we go, this game kind of sucks, which is why I got rid of it. If you want to see more content like that, consider supporting us on Patreon, as our reviews are not paid for by the publishers. So without further delay, let's crack on to the list of games. Now the first game on our list is Aeon's End and that's going to get me an awful lot of hate mail because it's an exceptionally popular game. I reviewed it this year and I said good things about it and it is fundamentally a good game but there are a few problems with it. The first one for me was that I got like an early edition of the game. It has slightly different cards and art styles to any of the later expansions so if I actually wanted to expand the game everything wouldn't look quite right so that didn't sit well with me. The second and probably biggest problem for me from the core set was the three player game which we ended up playing sucked. Like I really didn't enjoy the three player mode because it just seemed like the best thing to do was to use that bonus action to feed one player so they could get better cards and it meant one person at the table was getting twice as many plays. And I'm sure you can spread that around and make it so everyone gets an equal number of turns but that's not the most effective way to play and it just felt like a system that didn't work for me. We also played four player games and they were slow. So while it's a good two player game and while I'll probably play the app a fair bit, I just didn't feel the need to keep this one on my collection. If I'm going to play a two player deck building game like this, I'll probably play Legendary Aliens with Steph anyway. The thing is, I'd probably also be happy to play Aeon's End at someone else's house with someone else's collection, but I just can't be bothered going down the rabbit hole to get all of the extras and I feel the core game by itself is just a little on the thin side. Next up is Alien Artifacts, which was a game that I was really excited to play. It was billed as a sort of cross between 51st State and Race for the Galaxy, and those are two games I really quite like. And we gave it a shot, we gave it a fair go, and I, I just couldn't find the fun in it. I just felt like a poorer version of both games. It had the things I didn't like from Race for the Galaxy and the things I didn't like from 51st State sort of cobbled together into a sort of themeless, amorphous generic space game and yeah it just didn't do it for me i think if i wanted to play that sort of game again i'd go back i'd play race for the galaxy i'd pay 51st state i don't really see what game space that aliens artifacts has for me so that one was a really quick turnaround we played it twice we went yeah i didn't even feel the incentive to review it i was just that unenamored by it and we just put it on the pile. So the good thing about that one is I picked that up off a discount pile so I wasn't exactly out of pocket. I think I got back the money I bought it for selling it secondhand. So that's good. Buying cheap games means if they suck you can get rid of them and not lose that much money. 2020 was the year that I finally decided I don't like legacy games. I, I just don't enjoy them. And Charterstone was the game that brought that home to me. I played Charterstone, I gave it a fair shake, and it just I, it just didn't do it for me. And my problem with legacy games, and Charterstone in particular, is this. I like mastering games. I like playing a game multiple times and getting good at it. I like understanding the gameplay loops, and I like understanding getting better and better and better each time you play it. Discovering combos, discovering effects, discovering different things you can do to up your score or win more dramatically. The problem with legacy games is every time you finish a round, they add in new rules. So you're back to learning, you're back to the discovery stage of a game. It's a trick that keeps you from seeing the cracks in the game because as soon as you've finished a round, you're on to the next one. You can't reflect on just how imbalanced and weird that previous round was because you're already using different mechanics the next round. I found this in Pandemic Legacy where they were just adding systems every game and same with Charterstone and I just couldn't get the time to get comfortable with the game before it rocketed on to its next mechanical change. And if you like discovering new games and if you like playing a new game every week, that's fantastic because you get the familiarity of the core systems, but you also get the discovery every time you play. But if you're someone like me who just wants to get better at a game, who wants to learn a game and discover a game and get deeper with it, you just can't because it changes, 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 and then you're done. 
and that's why I got rid of Charterstone. I'd been playing it on the app primarily, and I just didn't see my group wanting to sit down and do a like six play game of it for like two or three weeks. <sighs> so yeah, legacy games, they just, they're just not for me. So don't expect to see any sort of legacy game content on three minute board games. They're just not my jam. I got rid of Mysterium. I know it's a popular game, but to me it feels like watching a mimic telling a story of the Hobbit in details while juggling balls in the air. I just don't get it. Anything could be right. Colonel Mustard with a pipe in the library? No? No? Miss Violet drinking a poison cup of tea in the subway? Wait, I know it's a red fish cutting the throat of a yellow dog or something. Next we have a game that I think's a good game, it just wasn't a good game for me and that's Cloudspire. I don't really know what a MOBA is, I've never played them, uh, I don't really get the gist and feel of the whole MOBA thing, so that didn't really speak to me, but mechanically this game looks solid and when we played it, it was okay, but no one in my group wanted to give it a second crack. Everyone played it once and I'm like, oh yeah, that's fine, let's, let's play something else. It just wasn't a game any of us were like, oh yeah, let's set up and have another round. Like, the experience was fine. It was okay, but there's just so much depth in this game and no one wanted to dive into it. Everyone was like, yeah, okay, that, that, that seems like a, I can see why people like that. It's not for me. And that was the consensus response with everyone I tested and played this with. So I was left with the decision, do I keep a giant box that no one's particularly interested in or do I push it onto someone He'll get a hell of a lot more enjoyment out of it. And I went with the latter. So again, Cloudspire, it's not a bad game. It's not designed poorly or anything. It just didn't click with me and it didn't click with anyone in my group. I'm not the biggest fan of deck building as a mechanic. It's not something that enamors me. It's not a mechanic I seek out and I try to get more and more games with deck building in them. It's just not my jam. I kind of like the mechanic when it's used well, like in Flamme Rouge or in the Legendary Aliens game, and especially in Blood Bowl Team Manager, but it's not my cup of tea. And that's ultimately why Dale of Merchants Collector's Edition kind of got punted out of the collection. Like Dale of Merchants is the deck building fans deck building game. If you are into this genre, this is a game you should seek out because it's really deep. It's really, there's a lot going on. But if you're not into deck building, it's just, it's overkill. It's overkill unless you are a massive deck building fan. So this is a game that if Dominion is your jam and you've played Dominion to death, absolutely seek out Dale of Merchants. You'll probably enjoy the hell out of it. If playing Dominion's kind of a chore to you, you will hate Dale of Merchants. And again, I didn't really hate the game, it's just, didn't really enjoy it either. It was just so much going on, so busy around a core mechanic that I just don't care for. Darwin's Choice is a good example of a game that's not bad, but it's not great. It's a, it's a good, it's an okay game, but it's a game that exists in the niche with a lot better games. And the game I'm really referring to here is Oceans. After playing Oceans and then looking at Darwin's Choice, I was like, yeah, yeah, you, you, you can go away. If I'm going to be playing an evolutionary based game, I'm going to play Evolution's Oceans. It's just, it's a better, deeper, richer experience for me personally than Darwin's Choice was. Nothing really wrong with Darwin's Choice. I can't sort of put the knife in this one, but Oceans is just for me a much, much better game. Cadwallon, City of Thieves. The art was great, the theme was intriguing, and getting my copy was a saga of Nordic proportions, which I will not go into here. Suffice to say, I was excited to be dashing across rooftops, filching valuables from intricately locked and fiendishly trapped chests, and absconding into the night. Imagine my disappointment when the game was nothing more than kicking in doors and scooping up whatever lay around, or should I say, lurking around in dark alleys until someone else scooped up stuff and then mugging them for their loot. So many games devolved into, I punch you and take your treasure, then you punch me and take it back, then I punch you, etc, etc. More like City of Petty Thugs if you ask me. Worse than that though, was that there were eight, count of eight scenarios to play, and they all boiled down to, get loot, get out. They made a game about weird and fantastical thievery boring. Now in case you weren't aware, I'm a big fan of science fiction games. I'm also a big fan of stuff to do with Mars and space colonization. 
I'm also a big fan of the coin series, so much so that I'm making my own game in the coin series. So the Expanse looked like it was going to be a grail game for me. It's about the Expanse. It deals with Mars. It's science fiction and it's coin adjacent. And it just really did not work for me. This is one of the most disappointing games for me personally I've played in a very long time because I hyped myself up about it. I got really excited about the whole milieu of ideas that would be behind this game and I put it on the table and it's just dry. It's just a dry sort of vaguely themed area control game. And for me, putting art and characters on a card does not equal theme. The fact that the different factions differences were so minute and it was just really the areas they controlled and maybe one tiny little power difference. Eh, like the Martian fleet should absolutely dominate the, the Belters fleet. Like, but the, the difference is the Martians got like two extra ships, two ships that were slightly better than the others. And it was just, eh. overall my group just found it a little flat. We were like, why would we play this instead of a coin? Okay, it's shorter than a coin, but it's just, it's also shallower and less interesting, less thematic, and yeah, you might as well just play Cuba Libre. Like, just, just go ahead and get that instead. Flick of Faith is a little dexterity game. It's, it's a dinky dexterity game in a giant oversized box, but there's not really much to it. Like you set it up on the table, you flick some pieces, you go, oh yeah, that was a great time, and then you're done with it. Like it's imminently forgettable. And when I initially played it, I was like, oh yeah, this is fun, that's something different. But I've picked up a bunch of other dexterity games since. And that includes Catacombs, it includes Ice Cool, and uh, Junk Art, and a few more. And as far as dexterity games go, Flick of Faith is very much towards the bottom of the pile in, in terms of quality, in terms of replayability, in terms of overall experience. So it's it's fine it's it's okay but there are way better alternatives out there like if you want a cool flicking game try catacombs it's it's really really legitimately a hell of a lot of fun doing an entire DD campaign with flicking like that's all i need to do to sell the game to you is what if DD but flicking speaking of deck building games Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle also left the collection this year and the less said about Harry Potter and its creator the better. But about the game, it's a very average sort of intro deck builder that adds content over and over until it becomes a sort of messy, chaotic jumble of mechanics and things. It, this game needed an editor. It seriously needed an editor. If it didn't have the Harry Potter theme, people would just trash this game because it's just, it bloats out. So it starts off nice and tight and then just adds mechanics through the seven years. And by the end of the seven years, you just kitchen sink. Yeah, uh, pretty forgettable game. Uh, and I'm kind of done with that franchise. And a great example of how board gaming tastes move on. 15 years ago, I played a lot of Puerto Rico. And over the last decade or so, I've thought, ah, we don't want to play more Puerto Rico, but I kind of wish I had a different theme. Then that game comes out, and it's New Frontiers, a race for the galaxy game. New Frontiers is just Puerto Rico in space with a lot of pretty aesthetics, but its core gameplay is essentially Puerto Rico. And it turns out my gaming tastes have moved on. It's not just the theme of Puerto Rico that doesn't interest me anymore. It's kind of the overall mechanics of the game as well. We also found that the military strategy in New Frontiers was really easy to do and really hard to counter so it created a sort of weird meta game like very early on playing this where people quickly identified that was a short route to power and that kind of killed its replayability in our group we played it a couple of times most of the time the person who went for the military strategy the hardest won hands down and was just yeah i'm i'm sure there are people out there who will tell me no no there's easy way to counter that you could do that you could do this fact is our group settled into that pattern that was our meta. The meta kind of killed the enjoyment of the game. So, yep, pass that one on. I guess I wanted Puerto Rico in space until I played Puerto Rico in space. I got rid of Unbroken. The whole Kickstarter Golden Bell fiasco behind Unbroken was not my reason for trading it off, as my copy was actually delivered in a reasonable amount of time. But I just found the solo play boring. I didn't give it much of a chance, 
but I'm okay at parting ways with it. So it's not often I get sent a game that I just don't talk about, and one of those games is Paradise Lost. This looked like a combination of Takedo and Cluedo, two sort of lightweight, family-friendly-ish sort of games chucked together to create something new and different. I was like, okay, it looks kind of interesting, I'll give it a go. And frankly, it's a goddamn mess. Like, I don't really want to just kick the crap out of this game, but it's not a good game. Like, sometimes I sell games. This one I just gave away. Like, you know, just take, get, get it out of my house. Because someone's like, oh, that sounds vaguely interesting. They then messaged me a week later and said, you bastard, it was terrible. So, you know, people complained about the free game I gave them. That's how the experience for Paradise Lost was for the three-minute board games crew. Not a great game. Honestly, play Takedo or Clue separately. The, the Frankenstein hodgepodge that is Paradise Lost just just uh, it's way too convoluted for what it wants to be and that's kind of unforgivable if you're going to make a simple game and sort of market it as a family friendly thing make a simple game but paradise lost also has the worst parts of kickstarter it's got metal pieces and it's got like this fancy board and it's wickedly overproduced so it's expensive and not very good and if something is expensive and not very good my recommendation is you stay the hell away from it. Like, full disclosure here, I'm friends with the guys from Garfield Games. Uh, Shim and Sam, you know, I spend time with them in my personal life, so some might say there's a little bit of bias here from me when it comes to reviewing the games. The fact is, they also just happen to make games I like. But this year, I got rid of one of them. And the game I got rid of was their classic Raiders of the North Sea. And that's because they put out Raiders of Scythia, and honestly, why do you need both? Like I get what Shim was doing here, trying to create a new version of his game and market it and put it out there. It's got some streamlined mechanics and I think it's a slight improvement on Raiders of the North Sea, personally. But you don't need both of them in your collection unless you're absolutely rabidly for that game. And I like Raiders, I think it's a really good game, um, but I really don't like it enough to have two copies of it. So North Sea, slightly weaker game for me, so I kept Raiders of Scythia. Raiders is still a good game, but honestly, I I get what he was trying to do with having the new version of the game, but also it doesn't really need to exist. It could have just been Raiders of the North Sea 2nd Edition. The next game fell victim to logistics, and that is that normally I have a maximum of five people at my gaming table at any time. Any game that requires six or more people, we just don't really play that often. Five is a good number for us. Four is also a good number. Six, pushing it. Seven, we just don't do that. We don't do seven or eight player games here. There just isn't enough space. And Rival Restaurants is a game that is amazing at seven or eight players. That's it. That's the reason I got rid of Rival Restaurants. It's kind of terrible at four or five players. It just, it just doesn't have the energy, the conflict over space, the yelling and shouting that makes the game work. So if you do have eight people, and honestly, who has eight people they play with routinely, it would be a great game. If you were buying it and playing it with four or five, it's going to be a super flat experience. And that's what we found. The tests we did at a friend's place with more than six players were absolutely amazing. The tests I did at my place with four or five players kind of sucked. So that's why that one has been punted from the collection. I also wonder how many people brought blood on the clock tower because that like takes 20 people or something to play like who's playing that at home anyone i got rid of crusader kings there was a lot i really liked about the game the bag building and drafting were cool and the player interactions had both competitive sides and negotiation sides but it missed the mark it was a long game three to four hours where the winner might score three or four victory points and nearly all of those came from one thing successfully sending someone on a crusade and doing those things seemed just a bit too luck-based. Whereas you'd spend ages maneuvering things over several turns and get almost no game end score for it. It felt like 90% of what you did wasn't helping you win the game. And the most interesting aspects of the game that drive the narrative didn't score you points, but you wanted to do them because they were cool. They also did that Kickstarter thing where you have a heap of extra miniatures that added nothing to the gameplay. 
some games I get out of the collection simply because they're too big for what they are, and Sabotage is one of those games. It is absolutely a gorgeous game. Beautiful art, beautiful styles, the components and everything are perfect, but it's essentially two-player battleship. And it really requires two teams of two to play properly, and that's just not a dynamic we have very often here. It's also a giant pain in the ass to teach because it's a hidden movement game and asymmetric, so you can't really tell the other person on the other side how to play as the game progresses because that's giving away hidden information. It's a game you need to play multiple times to get good at, and no one I've played it with really wanted to recommit to playing it multiple times. So we have this cool idea, and Sabotage is a really neat idea. Mechanically, it's a very clever game. Stylistically, it's beautiful, but it's also super, super niche. So if you're one of those people who has a lot of couples evenings where it's like two on two all the time and you like playing as couples, this could be a really solid good time for you, but that's not a normal sort of gaming group. And it's the difficulty of teaching an asymmetric hidden movement game that just scuppers this one for me. It just makes it a chore to put on the table and go, hey, who wants to play this? And then you have to do the full explain up front and then all the way through the first game, you're dealing with questions. And that, that alone was enough reason for me to pass this one on to someone else. And last, and certainly not least, is the game I did the behind the scenes documentary on, World of Tanks. The simple reason I got rid of World of Tanks is I don't want to buy 200 tanks. That, that's it. I don't want to start another collectible game. I've kind of sworn off doing LCGs and collectible games, so things like X-Wing and Armada, I'm not buying any more X-Wing or Armada. And if you'll see behind me, I'll be showing some pictures of me going through my cabinets of X-Wing or, or Armada. I've got lots of that stuff. I also have boxes and boxes of LCGs that don't get played anymore. So while I understand how good this format is for some people, for me, it's just a money sink. Now the World of Tanks game is fine, and if you're into World War II stuff, it's fantastic because it's basically X-Wing but tanks, and X-Wing but tanks should just print money, but personally, I am just not taking that plunge ever again. Until the next time I do. That's the end of the list. Are there any games on here you think I'm absolutely mad to have gotten rid of? Am I completely barking up the wrong tree with what I've said about things? Do you also find the same problem with legacy games, or are you a stalwart defender of them? If you have anything to say, let me know in the comments below. And remember, this content is entirely made possible by Patreon. If you want to support what we do here, if you want to support what we do here, please come support us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the notification button, subscribe to the channel, and come support us on Patreon. Take care.